So welcome everybody to the um, European Quantum Leadership Session 1 on quantum computing. Uh, it's a pleasure to have such great speakers here. Thank you very much for joining. And um, yeah, with these quantum uh, European Quantum Leadership Sessions, we want to show you how Europe paved the way to its industrial uh, leadership in quantum technologies uh, by presenting you insights into visions, products, success stories, and collaborations <clears throat> of leading startups, corporates, and RTOs as keys to position themselves uh, and Europe as a leader. Um, we all know the European quantum technology community is very strong. We have brilliant researchers, great engineers, many potential industry users. I would say we have enough money, enough private and public funding. Sure, it always can be more, but um, I want to tell you a short story. Um, a few years ago, I heard from a lot of representatives from corporates, RTOs and leading universities. We would need a holistic European um, in, uh, ecosystem support initiative. <clears throat> and um, I told them, okay, let's establish such initiative together. And they said, oh, no, we have a lack of resources or time or whatever. But yeah, it's easy to say we need and this and that, but yeah, don't do anything. And um, I think it's up to us. So we need an hands-on mentality. We need more speed, especially in, in deep tech and uh, quantum technology as the deepest of deep tech. And um, yeah, let's uh, take responsibility to do what it takes. Um, and we did. Um, with the support of the amazing QBN members, I was able to add uh, cluster management to the network uh, to the ecosystem because a um, uh, network is more than an ecosystem <clears throat> in an ecosystem um, every person every organization is in charge of its own partnerships its own business development and um, adding a cluster management that supports all stakeholders and manage the collaboration processes within this ecosystem provides additional value for all stakeholders uh, so QBN started um, with the aim to build Europe's best quantum business network uh, to transform the European quantum community, which we have at the moment, to a real quantum industry. Therefore, we promote networking, business creation, and the development of organizations within the field of quantum technologies and its value chains. Uh, how do we do that? We focus on people behind the innovation and um, provide a colorful bunch of activities and services. These are promoting networking, promoting collaboration, supporting startups, uh, promoting business development and so on. And one key activity are our QBN meetings, um, the exclusive uh, working group meetings um, for the four different fields uh, of quantum technologies plus the quantum enabling technologies. And these meetings, um, well, with these meetings, we want to provide the experts from industry and academia and science an, a trust-based environment for personal networking and knowledge, knowledge exchange. But yeah, that's enough for QBN. I want to invite you to join the network <clears throat> to transform the European quantum community to a strong quantum industry together. And I want you to save the date for the next um, European quantum leadership session, session two on quantum communication in February and um, the next session on quantum sensing in April. We also have um, at the moment uh, three um, dates for the QBN meetings on quantum simulation, computing and communication. So the closed and exclusive working groups and one QBN webinar on quantum computing for mobile applications. But enough from me. Um, let me introduce you to Frank. Uh, Frank Lerch um, is Managing Director at uh, Optic BB and co-organizer of this event. Um, and I think the first thing we did together was organizing the European Photonics Startup Challenge in um, the year 2016. Frank, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Can you yeah. see, hear me? Um, Perfect. I, would, I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. I would uh, like to share my slides. Can you allow me to do that, please? Maybe you should be able to know, yeah. OK, can you see my slides? Yeah. OK, it's not perfect. a full screen, but yes, no. 
<laughs> okay, thank you very much, uh, Johannes. And I'm also very happy to be here this morning. Um, uh, my name is Frank Leutsch. I'm the managing director of Optech BB, as uh, Johannes already um, indicated. Um, Optech BB, uh, of course, um, has somewhat more history uh, as compared to the quantum business network. Um, and uh, Photonics uh, here in Germany, uh, of course, has a long tradition. Also in uh, Berlin, we have a more than 200 year tradition in optics, at least. Um, today, uh, the photo photonics ecosystem uh, in the Berlin Brandenburg area has about uh, 400 uh, technology based uh, companies and um, some 35, 36 uh, research institutes. Um, just an indication on the size of the ecosystem, uh, we have about uh, 16,000 employees uh, active in uh, optics and photonics and roughly 3 billion um, euros uh, in revenues. And uh, of course, um, Optech BB, as the name already indicates, um, for 20 years we have been focusing on optical technologies uh, and photonics. Um, so the competences that we are covering is lighting technologies, laser technologies, uh, a lot of sensor metrology activities are going on, biomedical um, optics, um, also in the field of agri uh, technologies. Um, uh, we do have a lot of uh, communication uh, technologies uh, development in the research institutes and in the companies, uh, some microsystems uh, technologies activities um, and uh, on the level of components. And of course, as you all know, um, a lot or most of the photonics um, uh, technologies are uh, on the baseline of modern quantum technologies. And so uh, we also think that we have a say in quantum technologies. And um, more recently, we have seen a lot of activities especially in the research uh, area uh, in the berlin brandenburg uh, region as well. Uh, of course, we are um, connected uh, to all the other photonics regions in Germany under the umbrella of OptechNet Germany also already for 20 years now. I don't want to bore you too much uh, about what OptechBB is doing. As I said, uh, we have a 20 year history already. Uh, today we have uh, about 110, 115 institutional members, so companies and research institutes uh, active in optics. As I said, we are connected uh, under the umbrella of OptechNet Germany, but we are also uh, active on the European level uh, within the European Photonics Industry Consortium and uh, we are active um, in lobbying activities uh, at Photonics 21. Um, to uh, sum up already my little overview, uh, we are active, um, more or less, as I said, in optical technologies, photonics, uh, so laser technologies, lighting, uh, communication technologies, um, optical analytics, and um, especially in the field of com communication technologies, sensor technologies, uh, optical analytics. Um, uh, there are a lot of intersections these days uh, with quantum technologies, and so uh, we already organized a number of uh, webinars and um, uh, workshops uh, on that topic, uh, especially uh, during our photonics days in October uh, of this year. And of course, uh, we are planning to um, host and uh, collaborate in that field uh, further in the uh, next coming months. Um, in addition to those uh, technology uh, oriented activities like work group um, uh, meetings and uh, webinars and workshops, uh, we are also supporting our members, um, the institutes and companies and recruiting activities, international activities, uh, internationalization activities. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we support um, a multitude of startup activities um, and startups, um, not just in photonics, but in deep tech and also nowadays in quantum technologies uh, here in the Berlin Brandenburg region. And so I'm uh, especially happy that uh, one of the groups uh, that is presenting today uh, is uh, coming from the Leibniz Institute for Crystal Growth. Um, so um, David Übel and Owen Ernst will give a presentation later on uh, here today. Um, and with this, uh, I already uh, want to hand over again to Johannes, uh, since um, it's not our stage, it's your stage. Um, and um, I'm very interested uh, to learn um, uh, more on the latest developments in, in quantum uh, computing. So Johannes, back to you. Yeah, great, thanks Frank. Um, I uh, also want to uh, encourage all the participants to use the uh, Q&A section for uh, your questions. And um, all the participants will be able to um, answer these in the Q&A sections or later on live. And yeah, now I want uh, to start with the first talk and I'm very happy to welcome Ingolf Wittmann and um, Mark from IBM and Fraunhofer IAF um, with their talk, uh, the IBM Fraunhofer Quantum Project. 
Um, and a few words uh, to Ingolf. Ingolf um, was recently uh, IBM technical director and was in charge of high performance computing in Europe and uh, was the head of the global technical team of IBM quantum ambassadors. Uh, in August, uh, he took over the role as uh, head of business unit quantum systems at the Fraunhofer Institute for Applied Solid State Physics in uh, Freiburg, Germany, and moderates uh, Fraunhofer-wide uh, the project partnership with the IBM Q network, including the IBM Q System 1. Um, Mark has a lot of experience, uh, 36 years experience in the commercial exploitation of technology and research, um, 31 years um, of it at IBM. Um, he is quantum ambassador leader for Europe, Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific. He is also uh, IBM quantum business leader for uh, the DAF region. And uh, he currently teaches human and machine learning and quantum computing at the Institute of Cognitive uh, Science at the University of Osnabrück and quantum computing at the University of Heidelberg. So a very busy man. So I'm very happy to welcome you <laughs> and the virtual stage is yours. Thank you very much, Johannes. And I'll try to share my presentation. Okay, here we are. So uh, we already were introduced very well from, uh, from Johannes' side. And I just uh, like to uh, share with you what we like to <clears throat> uh, present today. So uh, to give you a little bit feedback about the IBM Fraunhofer Quantum Cooperation and program uh, between IBM and Fraunhofer. So uh, what IBM and Fraunhofer is doing in regards of uh, quantum technology, uh, talking a little bit about hybrid uh, hardware architectures and last but not least, uh, the IBM Fraunhofer community network and uh, the invitation for people who are interested uh, to join. So. Uh, let's have a short introduction of, uh, about the Fraunhofer IRF. Uh, Fraunhofer as such is a big organization. We are talking about more than 70 institutes and more than uh, 30,000 people. The majority are in, in the research environment. And the Fraunhofer IRF in Freiburg is one of the oldest uh, institutes. It was founded in 57. And uh, the major area where we are doing our research is in, within the sem semiconductor environment. Uh, we are looking for semiconductor solutions, uh, especially in the uh, diamond area. And that's uh, an interesting area for the quantum environment. And we will see more details later on. Um, and uh, when you are working within uh, the semiconductor environment, you need clean rooms. Uh, so uh, we have quite a decent uh, a big environment with more than a thousand square meters uh, where we can <clears throat> grow diamonds, but also can build uh, devices uh, also within the uh, uh, photonic environment. So Mark, what do you like to tell us about IBM in that regards? Well, IBM has a very, uh, a very long history of working with quantum computing. Um, and uh, I don't want to claim uh, authorship, but <clears throat> um, I think it was in 1961, Rolf Landauer <clears throat> derived the principle or showed that any kind of irreversible computation increases the entropy of the universe. Um, and in 1974, Charlie Bennett showed that any arbitrary computable Turing function could be rewritten so that it was reversible. Um, and uh, although at the time the, uh, uh, the implications of those two, um, those two discoveries were not completely clear, they basically paved the way for the idea of being able to do computations on uh, simple quantum mechanical uh, systems. Uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't say it, but both of them were IBMers at the time when they made these discoveries. Um, the, uh, the 1980s and 1990s saw 
significant progress uh, in the development of the underlying technologies. And in the 2000s, uh, IBM, uh, we really started to see some um, significant improvements in things like coherence times and error rates. But the, uh, the qubits we were working with were still not really, um, not really at the point where they were more than of uh, experimental interest. That changed, Ingolf, and you know this as well as I do, um, that changed in the 2010s. And in 2016, um, we decided to make our quantum computers, at the time, five qubit machines. We decided to make them publicly available because we realized that developing a technology like this for the market would mean exposing it to the market as early as possible in a nascent form. So in 2016, the IBM Quantum Experience was uh, was launched, and a year later, uh, we launched the IBM Q Network, where we invited um, commercial partners to participate in this journey um, with a guarantee of access to our latest and greatest machines. Um, we've, we're now in 2020, uh, heading rapidly towards 2021, uh, and I'm, uh, I'm very happy to say that uh, that journey is proceeding uh, much more rapidly than uh, any of us thought even possible back in 2016 or 27. Uh, all our projections have been uh, exceeded. Uh, and I'm very much looking forward to, uh, to working, or we're very much for looking forward to working with uh, Fraunhofer and others uh, in moving forward. Back to you, yeah. Ingolf. And that's uh, where the story is starting. So uh, back to 2019, um, there was a discussion between Angela Merkel and Gini Rometti, uh, the uh, CEO of uh, IBM at that point in time at the World Economic Forum in Davos. And uh, uh, Angela was uh, saying, oh, there's no physical uh, quantum computer. Uh, available and uh, that that and Ginny is a real salesman. She, she was really stepping in and saying, "I can sell you one if you like." So uh, and that was the starting point where uh, the IBM headquarter was starting the discussion with uh, the German government uh, with the Kanzleramt uh, how to get a uh, uh, quantum computer to to Germany. And I was uh, already uh, at that point in time. Uh, discussing with Fraunhofer in my role as an uh, as the IBM Q ambassador leader uh, for the participation in the IBM Q network. And that was a perfect fit for both sides because uh, Fraunhofer is opening up the uh, industry environment and the, the network and, and uh, the relationship uh, to industry organization and having also a big reach out uh, regarding technology. And we will see that in a minute uh, what we are doing here. And um, um, so there was an agreement in August. Okay, uh, let's uh, try to, to formulate something and do an, a big announcement in, uh, on the uh, International Automobile uh, uh, Exhibition in, in Frankfurt. And that was done in September. And then the real paperwork was st starting with the contracts and uh, all the stuff behind that, legal stuff, uh, IP stuff, and the uh, contract between uh, IBM and uh, Fraunhofer as such was uh, then signed in March 2020. And um, that was uh, including also a physical system. And that was the first time that uh, IBM was signing a contract for uh, installing a system uh, outside uh, the uh, US. Um, and the major reason for that was, and that was all, always the part of the discussion with the German government and uh, with the Baden-Württemberg uh, state government, uh, the major reason was data privacy. So everything is staying within Europe, within Germany and all project data are residing here and uh, it's under control of uh, German and, uh, and European privacy law. That was one of the major reasons really uh, to get those funds and, and to implement that. And the second was uh, to enable the industry and uh, to open up the environment for the industry uh, regarding quantum computing. So what's the current state? You are seeing the picture here. That's the IBM Q system one and uh, 
uh, the uh, parts were shipped in October, November timeframe. And actually the German uh, lab team is uh, uh, building up uh, the system. And uh, our hope is uh, that uh, the calibration will end or start uh, by end of December, so that in beginning of January 2021, uh, the system will be for internal usage for Fraunhofer and IBM available, and that we can make that uh, system available for the projects uh, which are planned uh, with uh, the academic environment, but also with industry partners in, in first quarter uh, next year. Uh, we are looking here on a system which is uh, consisting out of uh, uh, 27 qubits. Uh, it's, it's an industry stable system. Uh, it's not an academic system like the big systems uh, in the US, the more than 50 qubits. And it's having a quantum volume with uh, 64. And uh, just for the uh, size uh, here, we are talking about uh, 10 square meters uh, for that system environment and the power consumption of uh, uh, 10 kilowatts. And that's even interesting when we are comparing uh, the compute power uh, to, um, uh, to uh, supercomputing environments. And uh, uh, this is really in a range where you really need a big, big supercomputer uh, to uh, simulate an, a quantum system like uh, this one. And um, talking about 10, 10 square meters and 10 kilowatts, uh, that's, uh, that might be an, an option also to think about quantum computing in such type of environment. So Mark, uh, what's the uh, plan from the IBM side for the next uh, couple of years? Well, um, um... Yes, I'm, I'm smiling because I know, I know some internals about uh, about the machine in Einigen. Um <laughs> So the um, the the current, uh, if you will, the current generation, the current um, processor generation. Um, you will you will notice here that our processor generations are all named after uh, birds, a bird species. Um, the reason being that our uh, um, <clears throat> head of research is a. Uh, um, um, is an ornithologist, um, uh, so they're all named after birds. So the processor generation that you've uh, you, you've you've got you're getting in uh, in in Eningen is the Falcon series um, with a quantum volume of uh, as you said of sixty four. The uh, next generation of processors, the Hummingbird, um, which is uh, Currently available, uh, not available to uh, to IBM Q network members, but uh, um, is a, one of our research machines. These have sixty five bits. Um, the uh, and in twenty twenty one, we announced that we are going to produce the Eagle series with one hundred twenty seven qubits, and a year later, scaling up to Osprey four hundred thirty three qubits. And our stated goal is to reach just under 1200 qubits by 2023. Now, if you, uh, if you look at this foil carefully and the resolution of your screen is sufficient, you'll notice a slight difference. Um, it, uh, they all look like a, a paved, a paved uh, pavement, some paving stones, and you'll uh, see that the, the granularity, the size of those paving stones decreases as you move towards the right. Um, so one of the things we've discovered uh, over the last three or four years um, and the contributions of the IBM Q network and our experience actually working with these processes has, uh, has helped significantly in this is that there are certain two-dimensional topologies which, are, which loan themselves very well to producing uh, high-fidelity qubits um, and there are certain other topologies, um, particularly when you maximally connect adjacent qubits, which are not very good from the uh, um, fidelity point of view. Um, the best topology we found is this um, brick topology. Uh, if you can imagine the qubits are around, uh, I think 10 qubits are spaced around each brick. Um, so you're able to perform entanglement between adjacent qubits and between um, adjacent bricks, as it were. 
um, and um, things like things like uh, handling arbitrary uh, entanglement between arbitrary qubits. You can handle at uh, the compile time um, or at execution time. So there's a lot of thought gone into these topologies. We project that by 2023, we'll have sub 1200 or, or supra 1000 uh, qubit machines. And um, we, we know how to get there. There are uh, some, some pretty challenging uh, engineering problems to be fixed, but they are engineering challenges and not physics. Uh, so we know how to get to 1200 qubits. We also know how to get to a million qubits or millions of qubits. Um, there are some bigger technical challenges, engineering challenges, but they're not unsolvable. They're not unthinkable. So we estimate by the, uh, by the end of the decade, uh, we'll be at, at millions of qubits. We also in, uh, estimate um, that around 2023, with when we get to, uh, to more than a, a thousand qubits, one of the effects we will see here with things like uh, fast reset and uh, conditional compilation, uh, conditional execution, and basically an if statement, um, things like error correction will become possible. Uh, that means with error correction, you can implement um, error-free qubits or more or less error-free qubits, or you can, you can um, engineer away the major problems of uh, um, real qubit fidelity. And that puts us in a completely new environment um, and a completely new world as far as algorithms and uh, business problems is, is concerned. Uh, we are telling our customers that from 20 to 23 onwards, uh, the world of quantum computing will uh, accelerate even more than it's been doing. Um, the time to get involved and get engaged and to begin to understand what this means and how it works is not in 2023, it's now. Otherwise you will miss, miss the train that is already rapidly leaving the station. Um, so I will uh, use that as a, uh, as a hook back to you, Ingolf, to tell us about uh, uh, what that looks like. Yeah, and before we are coming really to that type of environment of uh, big systems like uh, thousands or million qubits, uh, we have to live with uh, uh, different um, uh, approaches uh, using the existing uh, quantum technology uh, in a hybrid quantum architecture environment. Uh, that means uh, we are talking about uh, uh, environments where uh, a quantum system is not, not big enough to uh, solve uh, uh, specific problems. Uh, so with that, uh, you have to slice and dice those uh, problems and to work with uh, traditional uh, IT infrastructure uh, uh, to, to build a solution around that. But uh, what we can think also about to use different type of technologies uh, within hybrid environment, uh, for solving parts which are more suitable uh, to those uh, regarding technology. So for example, uh, when we are talking about AI environments, then we can think about neuromorphic design, neuromorphic chips like the Synapse chip from, from IBM, where that part is then calculated on, on the neuromorphic environment. Uh, the quantum specific parts then are, are run on an IBM Q system or uh, quantum devices or uh, quantum accelerators. And traditional HPC codes uh, are running then on uh, traditional processors and, and, and GPU environment. Um, and with that, uh, a new uh, methodology of uh, um, HPC computing, but also uh, uh, um, academic or um, uh, computation has has to be invented and and uh, developed and that's I'm using that picture from from IBM because uh, that's really describing uh, very nicely how this can look like and uh, in which direction this, this could go and uh, a, a lot of uh, the Fraunhofer uh, work is going also in that direction how to build these type of uh, environments. Um, 
what we are doing on from the IIF side and where we are famous for, let's say it in that way, and um, I'm since August uh, on, on the Institute, and I really was impressed by what those guys are doing. And uh, uh, the IIF is, um, is uh, doing a lot of research in producing and growing industry diamonds uh, with uh, nitrogen vacancy centers. Uh, those uh, um, uh, devices are already used within the health environment for MR scans, for example. Um, uh, it's used in that way that a color sender in a ni nitrogen doped uh, diamond, uh, a single e electron uh, whose spin is used as a highly sensitive atomic sensor. Uh, and that can, can be used also uh, for, for qubit environments. That's uh, something where we are starting uh, to investigate uh, since here uh, for arithmetic uh, operation, for example. The big challenge here is to produce such color centers in diamonds in a defined way and then to address the electronic spin uh, specifically uh, to set a certain quantum state and uh, to read it out at the end, uh, so to, to get the, uh, the outcome. Um, uh, for sensor technologies, the electron is uh, allowed to interact with fields uh, to be measured. Uh, for example, in magnetic fields. So to, to investigate uh, uh, magnetic disks, for example, so, uh, if uh, everything is okay, or to uh, investigate um, uh, processor chips uh, if all lines are connected and, and, and working. Uh, for um, quantum computing, the additional challenge here is to entangle several of these spins uh, of those qubits in order to perform quantum gate operation. And that's something where we are actually uh, looking at. And for that, you need perfect diamonds. So uh, perfect diamonds uh, consisting out of carbon atoms. And uh, what we are doing, we are building uh, those uh, diamonds where we are removing two carbon atoms and putting uh, uh, one nitrogen atom uh, in, in, in that environment and uh, the second carbon atom space is left uh, uh, spare. Um, to build these uh, NV centers, those diamonds have to be very clean. So we are talking about uh, point, uh, one parts per one million parts. So the production process is very sensitive and, and very difficile. And uh, from the theories, as theoretical side, uh, so uh, cupids would work at room temperature. So that's a big difference uh, to uh, the transformant cupids uh, uh, where we need really a, a very low temperature. And uh, uh, those uh, qubits may then also work in mobile environments. Um, the important core competencies for exploitation of those quantum uh, states are uh, on the one hand, the material development in the diamond field, but uh, above all, the expertise in optoelectronics and microwave technology, which must be used for the excitation of the color centers uh, on the atomic scale and further development uh, to this. And uh, this is also part of uh, the uh, research within the uh, Fraunhofer environment. And can also uh, be applied to, uh, trans to the transmon environment, for example. So that's something what we are doing uh, at Fraunhofer. And uh, if you can, if Corona will, would be over, then uh, uh, to visit that environment, that would be very, very interesting. So besides the, um, uh, to build a qubit out of diamonds, we are all already thinking about to build an small devices with uh, 10 qubits or more uh, uh, for quantum computing as uh, space technology. And that's something where we are getting actually uh, government funds and uh, research contracts uh, with the industry where we are working closely uh, together with the industry. The reason uh, for that is uh, there's a race uh, about quantum computing within Europe and in Germany and from the uh, EU uh, quantum flagship program, uh, we are thinking uh, two systems will be funded. 
And uh, on uh, the uh, German federal government side, we are uh, thinking uh, also two systems will be uh, funded and uh, by Baden-Württemberg, Bavaria and Nordrhein-Westfalen, uh, three additional systems might come up. And um, those funds are not looking for the same technology. Uh, those funds are looking for different type of uh, uh, technology within the uh, qubit uh, environment and uh, for the quantum computing as such. Um, and uh, so most likely we are thinking about transform qubits, about diamond qubits and photonic uh, 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 quantum computers which might be applying here. And on the other side, you have to build up the uh, software environment. Uh, and there is the uh, very famous uh, open source Qiskit, for example, or CERC from, from uh, Google. But uh, there are other uh, software environments which have to be adopted also uh, to those uh, uh, technology. And last but not least, you need also the, the application environment. And that's something what we try to apply with uh, a specific environment within the Fraunhofer um, uh, community uh, from uh, base technology to the application environment uh, of uh, uh, quantum computing. And that's done with the Fraunhofer Competence Network uh, for quantum computing. Uh, uh, seven main institutes are building those uh, with seven uh, different uh, states within Baden-Württemberg. And uh, uh, I'm pretty proud uh, that the most advanced center actually is uh, Baden-Württemberg led by CIRF, uh, Professor Ambacher. And uh, we are already starting off with projects uh, by 1st of January. So the uh, uh, projects um, uh, will be lifted off uh, by the uh, state government in Baden-Württemberg in, in December, so those will be announced. And it's really covering uh, from uh, base uh, uh, hardware technology really to the uh, application environment. That's covered with, within that. And our mission is also to educate and to develop uh, the, the industry and uh, to enable the industry for uh, quantum technology. And that's something where I like to invite everybody uh, startups, uh, industry companies, uh, uh, banks, uh, insurance companies, uh, but also the uh, uh, universities uh, to, to join that network and, and to work closely with us uh, to bring that uh, forward. So Mark, what is IBM doing in, in that regards? So uh, I mentioned before that in, nine, in uh, 2017, uh, we started the uh, IBM Q network, the IBM Quantum Network. Um, the uh, initially, I think there were uh, three or four members. Um, we've since grown that network to uh, um, actually, it's the 132 is incorrect. We're getting towards 150 now. Okay. Um, the uh, but my my bad. Um, what you'll see here is a range of uh, universities of um, research institutes such as Fraunhofer, um, uh, around 30 startups who are active in the quantum world. Um, and active means um, from, from companies working on algorithm development to uh, organizations working on uh, engineering physics of uh, quantum computers. Uh, and a number of also a number of companies um, such as um, JP Morgan Chase, ExxonMobil, um, Mitsubishi Chemicals, and others who are engaging with IBM on developing actual use cases um, in the timescale of the next, uh, next three years. In addition to that, uh, we have a number of hubs, Fraunhofer and uh, the University of Tokyo uh, at the forefront, uh, Fraunhofer has the <clears throat> distinction of being the, as Ingolf mentioned, the first, the first uh, um, machine that we've installed outside the first, the first IBM Q network machine that we've uh, installed and built up outside the US. Um, the machine in Tokyo, we're going to begin 
begin construction of that very soon. That will be going live uh, later in 2021. Uh, we anticipate that uh, um, there will be an increasing need for such machines, um, um, and we anticipate also that the uh, this this network, this ecosystem we're building up, uh, will will increase in size uh, in the coming years. The primary function of the network is to uh, enable organisations to get in uh, at the beginning of the quantum computing revolution, uh, I'm, I'm sure it's going to be a revolution, um, to understand the implications of this new technology. Um, it's, it begins with the, the way you program a quantum computer, which is uh, very, very different from the way you program a classical computer, through to the kinds of problems you can solve with the quantum computer. Um, and the way you translate classical problems into problems or, or algorithms that can be run on a quantum computer. Understanding all that is a tall order. Um, and um, the, uh, the chances to develop intellectual property uh, for each of these members to develop their own intellectual property um, in a, let's say, a protected environment is, uh, is of significant value. Um, we're always interested in, uh, of course, in hearing from people who'd be interested in joining the Q network, either with IBM or, of course, uh, uh, especially here in Germany with, uh, with Fraunhofer. Um, so uh, um, the Q network's there. We, uh, we're looking forward to seeing it expand over the next years. Um, and uh, it's produced, I think it's produced around... Uh, um, 400 academic um, scientific papers um, since its inception uh, in the sense of um, people using IBM quantum systems to, um, to perform work which has resulted in uh, algorithm or exper experimental um, results um, um, progress uh, which has been published. So very, very interesting from the point of, uh, of IP development in, uh, in quantum computing. And um, yeah, I'll, with that, back to you, Ingolf. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. And um, um, I'm re really like to invite everybody who like to join the network and the cooperation uh, of Fraunhofer and IBM. And the interesting part uh, with Fraunhofer is uh, we can offer something what IBM cannot offer or is not able to offer. It was always a wish when I was on the IBM side here. Uh, to have uh, tickets uh, where people can buy and then use the, uh, uh, the uh, IBM Q network environment. And that's something what we are offering. So uh, we are offering uh, when the paperwork is done, uh, that's a little bit uh, um, um, uh, a work, but uh, when the paper paperwork is done, then uh, people can uh, buy uh, one month tickets uh, to use that type of environment and uh, also the bigger back-end environments of the IBM Q uh, network uh, stuff, uh, for example, systems in, in, in Yorktown. And uh, we are looking really for uh, interested parties who like to join here and to become a, a member within the Fraunhofer quantum uh, network, but also within the IBM Q uh, uh, network in, in that environment. So thank you for that. And I'm open for questions and answers and some Last works from you, Mark. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Johannes, and uh, the Quantum Business Network for the chance to to talk to you. Um, I think we all have a <clears throat> a very very exciting few years in front of us uh, with quantum computing. Um, uh, I've absolutely, uh, as a child of the '60s, so I was born in the year that uh, Rolf Landauer uh, made his discovery about irreversible computing, consuming, inc increasing the entropy of the universe. Um, I, uh, I sp started working, uh, as you mentioned, Johannes, for IBM in 1989. 1989, two significant things happened: um, the Berlin Wall fell, and uh, this new hypertext system called the World Wide Web was invented. Um, and I was I joined IBM to work on this, so I've I've been a midwife to the World Wide Web for IBM, and I've observed the changes and impact that's had on society and business. 
um, I think that quantum computing's impact is going to be bigger uh, than the web. That's my personal personal feeling. So um, I'm here for the duration. Uh, I very much look forward to working with any of you, all of you, um, uh, collaborating, cooperating, competing. It doesn't matter. Um, I think we're all in for a very exciting time. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark and Ingolf. And I totally agree with you that uh, it will have a huge impact, <laughs> definitely. Um, so I think we have time for one or two quick questions. And um, I saw one question in the chat. Um, where is it? Where is it? Um, I think it's um, the question was, um, how many systems do you intend to um, to install or to manufacture um, if you think of um, the Falcom system, for example? As, as many as possible. As many as possible. <laughs> no, we, we, uh, you won't find us making statements about plans, uh, specific plans on numbers, but uh, um, we don't intend to, uh, to stop at one, that's for sure. Okay. One thing we have to say is, uh, I think no company has built more uh, quantum computing systems than IBM. I think uh, we are, meanwhile, uh, beyond uh, 20 or something like that, Mark. No, no comment, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> significantly, <laughs> significantly. <laughs> Sounds great. And uh, the, second, the second question uh, would be from my side. Um, what are you think are crucial actions you would recommend um, for Europe and its ecosystem to pave the way to a European quantum leadership? Oh, that's a very good question. And I'm sitting also on uh, European boards uh, um, for, for quantum computing and HPC and uh, also running the Bitcom uh, uh, working group uh, for HPC and, and quantum computing. And th this is an uh, imminent uh, discussion base uh, between companies, but also the, the government environment. And I think uh, uh, the recommendation is uh, that we have to work jointly together really to build these systems that uh, uh, that type of environment is really built up within Europe as a joint effort uh, between the academic environment and the industry environment, but also with the international partners, so the non-European companies, let's say it in, in, in that uh, way. That's, that's very crucial and, and important. And if we, we can achieve that, then uh, we build a quantum environment, which might be different from what's uh, uh, actually looking like from the uh, yeah, US side, but also Japanese side. And we will see what from China is coming. So collaboration is the key. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah. And uh, I, I, uh, I always like to say that um, the, and I did, there was an example was earlier um, with the uh, photonics um, I've forgotten the exact number, but it was uh, just under 400 companies just in Berlin working on photonics. If you go to Jena or other locations, it looks the same. Um, the number of people working on photonics in Germany, just photonics, it's incredible. You will find this nowhere else in the world. Um, if you look at the university research on uh, quantum physics applications, it's, it's unparalleled on this planet. Germany leads the world in the fundamental technologies. We're also a, um, if not the, one of the major uh, industrialized or industrial production um, nations on earth. Uh, it seems to me as a, a I was born as born British and a naturalized German. It seems to me like it's really obvious, just bring the two together. Um, I think we have to find ways to do that. And uh, the Quantum Business Network and other initiatives are the right way to do that. Thank you so much, Mark. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you excuse me my yeah. extra extra two oh. minutes for that. <laughs> no, it's perfect. Advertising, uh, advertisement for QBN is perfect. No, that's, that's exactly what we want to do with QBN and um, also um, in partnership with the other initiatives um, in quantum technology. So, yeah. Um, I think we will reach uh, the 500 uh, for Germany in a few years in quantum technology as well. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank you again, Ingolf and Mark. And um, now I want to quickly hand over to Thorsten. Um, Thorsten is uh, the co-founder and director of development and engineering at uh, 
um, Orange Quantum Systems uh, from Delft. He received his diploma in physics and a PhD in uh, electronical engineering from the Ruhr University Bochum. And before co-founding uh, Orange Quantum Systems, Thorsten was part of the team at QTech in Delft that developed the Quantum Inspire, uh, Europe's uh, first public multi-qubit quantum computing platform. And yeah, he has his talk, uh, we are enabling the future of quantum computing through co-development. And Thorsten, the virtual stage is yours. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Johannes, for this nice introduction. Uh, first of all, do you see my slides? Not in full screen, but we see it. Okay, now it's getting bigger, maybe. Now it's perfect. Okay, let me do stuff here on my side still. Okay. Yeah, again, thank you very, very much for uh, introducing uh, me here to the stage and also for giving us the opportunity, Orange Quantum Systems, to introduce ourselves a bit and um, our value proposition to the ecosystem. As you already mentioned, uh, we are a spin-off from QTech in Delft in the Netherlands and it um, becomes clearer kind of what we are after, after. So let me check whether I can turn the page. Um, <clears throat> as the previous speakers already mentioned, quantum computing has indeed um, far reaching potential and um, commercial applications of quantum computing in general are to be expected in a variety of industrial sectors, ranging from health, pharmaceuticals, to material science, finance, logistics, you name it. And um, that's also why in recent years, quantum computing as a field has experienced a significant increase in innovation and competition. But what's also important to, to state here, and I want to stress this in the following slides a bit more, we are not there yet. And um, I also want to say that we in Europe also need to get our hands dirty to um, build things. Um, next to the large potential quantum computing holds, there are still considerable scientific as well as engineering challenges looming. So, uh, which need to be tackled on this long road towards uh, universal quantum computing. And um, for starters, it is important, even though um, maybe that not for all of us, it's clear right now, the transistor of the quantum era is not yet called or determined. There are quite a few uh, contenders out there, um, various physical platforms, including circuit-based technologies, which were already addressed today, like transmons, but also photonics and laser optical solutions like photonics, um, atoms, ions are out there. Um, all of these platforms have indeed um, their pros and cons, um, and they all need to be measured up against um, <clears throat> our most urgent questions right now for the upcoming years. And, well, I would call it an agenda 2025 of sorts, um, whether it's indeed possible to, to bridge the ravine between technology with its limited readiness at this point in time and the use cases and uh, meaning, hence bridging the gap to the level of quantum advantage. Uh, some of these technologies um, have already accomplished um, certain feats, um, kind of highly announced last year. Um, ex first experiments were shown from um, Google team under Martinez that uh, quantum supremacy experiments were performed. More, much more recently, um, a Chinese um, research group announced a similar experiment or different experiments in the bosonic um, counting and uh, also came up with um, interesting results. But none of these experiments so far um, really kind of um, claim that have accomplished considerable quantum advantage um, for real world applications. And um, coming now to a little bit uh, more closer to what Orange Quantum S Systems is doing. Um, we as in Orange Quantum Systems are focusing on system level aspects for circuit based technologies. Our idea is in offering a wide range of products and services to the growing quantum computing R&D market. And uh, what's important to note is that we are focusing on expediting the process of setting up 
our customers quantum computing technology labs so if somebody would be interested in learning how to get these circuit based technologies up and running we will be able to help you <coughs> by supporting um, yeah by setting up these systems uh, we're offering products and services up to the level of device development platforms or um, algorithm development platforms. And uh, what's interesting, um, also system could in principle be delivered turnkey, but also could be provided through co-development. So learning together. So um, Orange Quantum Systems as uh, how we want to place ourselves, we see ourselves as systems integrator. And um, yeah, as already mentioned, um, we would like to support our customers in uh, helping them to, to close this quantum advantage gap from the hardware perspective. Um, yeah, so important to know is that we are not starting from scratch. Um, the Delft ecosystem has been pushing the limits of quantum science and technology here in Europe for already three decades or so. The first 20 years um, formed the basis with um, basic discoveries and investigations into quantum transport of nano devices. <coughs> we can talk a lot about what has been accomplished there. But I think there is no time for that. Um, and uh, the next decade or the, the next step was in the last decade, pretty much uh, where at the verge of 2010, um, some considerable discoveries um, in the um, in the basic sciences of quantum transports um, encouraged the community actually that we can think bigger and that we actually can think of uh, bringing uh, quantum technology or quantum computing to the next level. Uh, one of them is um, that transmon qubits, the evolution of superconducting qubits, were considerably um, promoting this um, aspect and uh, the other part is also <coughs> shifting um, the research in semicon nano devices from group three, five semiconductors towards group four semiconductors such as silicon and um, germanium. And I think we will hear about that also later on a bit more. Um, five years ago, uh, the Technical University of Delft and TNO, the Dutch research organization for applied scientific research, pretty much the counterpart of Fraunhofer on the Dutch side, <laughs> uh, decided to form a partnership organization, which is called QTEC. And one of the rare things or recognitions in the Netherlands is um, QTEC also received from the, from the king and queen, uh, the national icon status. So giving kind of a push that this is really something uh, unique and important to work on. And uh, that is also being recognized <coughs> by, by international partners. Uh, the Delft ecosystem is uh, uh, already now for years um, co-development technology with major international partners and um, it is also going further. So now it's 2020 and um, for most part, I think it was a rough year for many of us, however, um, for, for the Delft ecosystem, it was also an interesting year um, from, uh, we went further, we went to the next phase. Um, we were able to, um, earlier this year, um, launch Europe's first public demonstrator platform in quantum computing, Quantum Inspire. And uh, we are also making the first steps now uh, in commercialization and uh, figuring out together with the QBN and others, how to actually form a market for this um, technology. Let me say, so I want to have a few words on the Quantum Inspire, um, if I allow, before I go back to um, what um, Orange Quantum System is offering. So um, Quantum Inspire is um, actually the first multi-qubit demonstrator platform worldwide and completely made in Europe. It's also maybe interesting to know. And uh, it has to offer a, a simulator backend and hardware backends. And uh, if somebody wants to um, study or investigate their algorithms <coughs> on ideal qubits, you can do that up to uh, 31 ideal qubits, highly connected, could be simulated on the biggest um, supercomputer here in the Netherlands, Surf Sara. 
um, we have a standard uh, transmon based um, highly connective um, qubit processor online, <coughs> our Starmon 5, with a high qubit connectivity in a 2D plane, of course, and fast two qubit gates. But on top of this, we also offer um, a small uh, spin qubit processor, which is also, it's the first, pretty much the first um, CMOS compatible um, quantum processor unit, yeah, online and accessible through the web. And uh, we can maybe later on also discuss a bit more the differences and commonalities of these systems. But uh, what I want to say here is that um, the spin part here could be uh, the, the next generation of, of um, quantum computing units offering long coherence times and uh, also a very strong CMOS compatibility oh, um, and slightly different from the transmon approaches. Now, uh, let me get back to uh, what is actually under the bonnet of these systems. And uh, this is a very common setup, which we have here in Delft, um, which pretty much shows the full picture. And uh, it's pretty much starts with a quantum processing unit, which is connected via interconnects uh, in the cryogenic fridge to um, control electronics. But what is important here for the community to know, a chip, cryogenics, and control electronics, you don't have not yet a quantum computing set up yet. Uh, you need a fourth layer, calibration and characterization, that glues the system together. Um, so from the perspective of academic environments, this is already a very good system. <clears throat> and um, just to give you an example, the um, academic groups um, have in, in, in Delft have of the order of 30, 40 systems, I think, up and running. However, um, when you think of um, moving from a setup with academic research into a product for customers with uh, much more down, to, uh, which much lower downtime and um, much more well defined interfaces, you also need. <laughs> uh, much more sophisticated system integration efforts. And this is pretty much the fifth layer here. And if we accomplish that, um, algorithms can be executed on the system. So the question is, what is actually Orange Quantum Systems offering? Um, we pretty much focus our attention on calibration and characterization and system integration. And kind of if somebody needs help at various um, layers in the system and how to connect them, this would be uh, where we could help. Here, one more time, um, short summary. Um, so our focus is on system integration, calibration, and characterization of these setups. Uh, we experience knowledgeable in engineering of the different interfaces of hardware and software components. And uh, what is also important, we have a professional automated or calibration and characterization framework, Quantify, uh, with which we can automate experimental physics. And then, of course, um, trans this translates into realizing the maximum device potential of the quantum processing unit. Yeah, we have a few minutes left. I want to summarize um, what we have on offer for the community, um, our products and services. And uh, on the left side, you will see that, uh, yes, indeed, um, we could um, provide you with demonstrator platforms or device development platforms if you're interested more in uh, manufacturing of these devices. Or we can also provide you with um, uh, sophisticated solutions for algorithm development platforms. But um, if you also think on the right side, uh, your, you, your approach is not the whole stack or the full system right away, uh, we definitely can offer you engineering su support and on each and every layer. We have our focus is also very strongly on customized control software aut automation. And um, Another offer is um, if you're kind of the person going into the clean room and want to build stuff, um, we could also offer you the solution of um, device characterization or certification to, to, to bring this technology further. 
So um, these are the products and services we can also discuss later on if you want. Um, but uh, I also want to quickly introduce our uh, team of co-founders. Um, besides me, uh, Harald Alberts is the managing director of Orange Quantum Systems. The director of research and development is Adrian Roh. And uh, complemented is our uh, team of co-founders by Kelvin Lowe and Amber von Hauermeyeren. Um, in the last one or two minutes, I also, uh, Johannes was asking us to give um, a picture of uh, how we see um, Europe placed. And I think I already gave you quite a few examples that uh, Delft would be a good place to be, to, to, to work with. But um, I want to zoom out a bit on a higher level. So what actually are the challenges which we want to tackle in the next five years or so? <clears throat> and these are the application problem, the QPU manufacturing problem, and the QPU calibration problem. So now there is an interesting, I think, slight different take as compared to the first speakers. Um, I have the feel that um, uh, the, the, the first uh, talk was more driven that um, public American corporation would take care of building the system and we would be kind of figuring out in Europe what to do with them. I would highly encourage to, to slightly think differently um, our approach should be also in some respect uh, making our hands dirty and actually build these systems gradually bigger and bigger. So we have to have um, entities here in Europe who build quantum computing systems and uh, down to the level of also providing quantum processing units. So how we have to figure out how to build new um, pilot lines in the system. And the gain for this would be, of course, extremely, or what would be very, very valuable, of course, um, keeping this technology also in Europe um, well and alive, would be we would get for free highly trained professional workforce and for quantum computing, but not only that, also for the next generation high-tech information technology. Um, what I want to say, still, I'm very much optimistic that we can do that. Uh, Europe has all what's needed to flourish in an emerging global quantum computing ecosystem. Well, the baseline, we have excellent scientific core. We are having a growing list of startups and industrial players getting interested in that. Uh, we already have actually world-class enabling technologies and component providers. But the interesting fact here, and that's um, what I heard also, I hope that uh, will be discussed um, later on a bit more. We have a new, new, unique European phenomenon, the European RTOs, research and technology organizations, like Fraunhofer in Germany, like uh, C.A. Leti in France or TNO in um, the Netherlands. And I think they could be in some aspect um, the leader or kind of the glue uh, to bring this together in a kind of, um, yeah, in, the, the glue who could bring us together in some way to, to, bright, to, to provide the path towards innovation here in this sector. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more, um, in recent, um, yeah, two months ago, a white paper was written on this aspect of uh, European RTOs and how, they're, how they could help in this, um, um, in this way. And um, in short, we have, I only sketched out two important citations. I think a public-private partnership will be key for the foreseeable future. And uh, what we also have to take care of is um, when we want to also be challenging the world with uh, QPU manufacturing and calibration, um, our efforts need to be, uh, need to remain competitive in performance and time scale against the international developments. <clears throat> so also we should soon think about a kilo qubit system here in Europe. Um, what could be the solution? And that's pretty much I'm closing with this presentation is we should embrace a pan-European collaboration and co-development effort. And with that, uh, thank you for your attention and uh, happy to receive some questions. Yeah, thank you very much, Thorsten. Uh, I have nothing to add to your last slide. <laughs> it was perfectly summarizing um, all the efforts we uh, have to take. <clears throat> um, at the moment, there are no questions, but um, I am quite sure there will be some more questions um, uh, later on after the talk. 
And uh, yeah, you can answer them uh, always in uh, the Q&A section. Um, <clears throat> so um, the, the next speaker um, will be from Australia, um, Andrew Horsley, um, CEO and co-founder of Quantum Williams. Uh, he is a quantum scientist and engineer with a career focused on designing, building and operating practical quantum devices. Um, he has worked between Australia, Switzerland and Germany and led the experimental diamond quantum computing efforts at the Australian National University prior to founding uh, Quantum Brilliance. Um, yeah, and uh, Andrew, you are very active uh, with Quantum Brilliance in um, Europe and I'm looking very much forward to hear more about your work and um, how Quantum Brilliance um, strengthen and push Europe forward regarding quantum technologies. Thanks so much, Johannes. It's a pleasure to be with everyone today. So as Johannes said, we're a quantum computing full stack company from qubits out to uh, quantum applications, coming out from Australia, but then with very deep roots in Europe as well. And so having uh, then core activities in both countries is our key plan. We're, you know, we're the only company in the world doing uh, using diamond and room temperature diamond to build quantum computers. And that's reasons of both IP and, and uh, technical expertise. And what it means is that we have a very different vision to uh, others in terms of what quantum computing can be and the direction that that can go. So really our goal is about making quantum computers uh, just like any other component of computing technology, just like your CPU or GPU. And so our goal in five years is to have shrunk down quantum processes to something the size of a lunchbox that's providing already then a useful quantum advantage. And that's quantum advantage not compared necessarily to a supercomputer, but compared to the other components of a supercomputer. So compared to a GPU card or compared to a CPU. And then that's something that you can then uh, build up and deploy on mass, just like you deploy CPUs and GPUs on mass. So in a, super, in a supercomputer or a data center environment, then this would be having thousands of quantum processes deployed within that in the racks alongside everything else. Um, but then we can also take it out and, and find uh, use in all the ways that cloud classical computing is in a solution. Uh, we can provide then uh, local low latency quantum acceleration in that wide range of applications. So that's our pathway. And then in the immediate term and over that next five years, we're able to offer customers then immediate access to quantum hardware uh, based around then a few qubits and uh, growing uh, in, in diamond quantum systems. So that's something that we're doing field trials here in Australia uh, in the first half of 2021, and then looking to uh, deploy that around the world after that. And that's something that we'll deploy uh, on site for users uh, in, in, for example, a server room environment. So to start with that, and then I'll kind of take you through, okay, what are all these uh, that we're looking to do and a bit more details about these two boxes. Um, to start with a bit about ourselves, so I'm then the CEO, I'm one of the three co-founders of Quantum Brilliance. I'm, uh, as you might tell by my voice and, and everything, uh, from Australia, but I did my PhD in Basel. I lived there for about six years and uh, my partner's from Germany, very close ties then uh, for myself to, to Europe and for my co-founder Marcus Doherty as well. Most of our careers have really been spent collaborating very closely with partners in Europe. And then we're now a team of about 15 going on 25, uh, coming out and based at the Australian National University. And that's really somewhere that's been at the epicenter of diamond quantum science and technology for the last 40 years. And Marcus, uh, my co-founder is then uh, the, the go-to guy for the theory of quantum diamond systems, particularly the NV center. We're also then based in Stuttgart in Germany. And so, oops, there we go. Then that's a, that's a team that we're starting to build up and we're looking to really have a broad range of activities there. So like, like the other um, uh, presenters today, I strongly echo that uh, sentiment that Europe is a place that has everything for success here, except the companies to actually build quantum computers. So there's incredible uh, talent base in quantum technology, but also all of the enabling technologies and precision manufacturing. 
there's then research partners around Europe, so not just Germany, but um, then, you know, in, in the Netherlands and in the UK and in France, the, there's big companies that have incredible high-tech programs but no appetite for building quantum computers themselves. And then there's incredible government investment. So we really see the missing piece in translating all of this potential into a strong quantum industry is companies like Quantum Brilliance that, and say Orange Quantum Systems that would be coming in and helping build quantum computers and having that European uh, manufacturing capability and local uh, supply chain. So this is something that hopefully I'm conveying, I'm personally very passionate about, um, then um, uh, this, is, this is our second home as a company and as founders. And we see there's a potential, particularly for Diamond, where then Diamond has this unique ability to uh, really transform out how we think about quantum computing. And then we're able to, to uh, be the vehicle for that success in Europe. So like everyone, we see quantum computing as then one of the ways that we're going to move beyond the limits of current computing architecture. It's not going to replace current computing architectures, but it's going to augment them and work alongside them. And one of the challenges there uh, is that current architectures are starting to really run out of steam uh, with, with the transistor starting to hit, uh, get towards atomic limits. We've already seen single quantum processors from Google outperform the world's largest supercomputers for certain tasks. But the challenge is we're going back to this mainframe era of quantum compu of computing, rather. So just like in the 1950s and 1960s. So these are going to be confined to large facilities. There's only going to be a handful of them deployed. And whilst they're going to do incredibly important tasks, they are going to transform industries. They are also going to be fundamentally limited in the types of applications they can support. And so what we're looking to do is break free from that. And one of the key things also for quantum computing is at the end of the day, we want a box that's solving our problems faster. So the other thing I like to introduce is size, weight, power, and ultimately cost as key metrics alongside the performance of your device. And then how we define quantum advantage at quantum brilliance is then when you have two boxes of comparable size, weight, power, and cost, and one of them is outperforming the other for a certain task. And so, with systems that are uh, in, in a kind of superconducting context, for example, then really the only way is up in performance. There's a bit of wiggle room in, in size, weight, power, but right now the direction is really in, in scaling these systems up. And the threshold and the comparables are supercomputers. The, what we're able to do is rather than having these room size devices though, we can shrink it down, as I said before, to things that are the same size, weight, power as the components of a supercomputer. And so all we have to do to provide quantum advantage is significantly be a component of that uh, for a certain task. And so it turns out that you can cross that threshold with even a few tens of qubits. Uh, so depending on size, weight, power and the particular application, that might be even 20 or 30. And certainly by the time you hit 50 uh, noisy qubits, then you've crossed into that realm of quantum advantage. Now, that's not where we end our journey. Uh, we'll continue up to hundreds and thousands of qubits and beyond. But that's then happening in the context of devices that are now providing a quantum advantage. And so people are engaging with them, not to get ready for quantum, but because it's actually solving their problems faster already. And so that really changes then the scope of uh, engagement with quantum computing. And so we like to then talk about, um, just like in the mainframe era, that was then transitioned with the introduction of classical microprocessors into turning classical computing into an everyday technology. That's what we're trying to do with quantum. We're building quantum microprocessors using our room temperature diamond technology that aims to make quantum computing just another everyday technology. At the heart of it, we have a nitrogen vacancy center. So we're using spin qubits, just like trapped ions, uh, neutral atoms. And the, the aim of the game in all of these systems is trying to find ways to isolate your qubits from the environment. Basically, in a quantum computer, you need to control the qubits, you need to isolate the qubits from the environment, and obviously, you need to assemble those qubits. And, and um, the typical way to assemble them uh, in the spin qubit sense is trapping them uh, either with a crystal, like it's diamond or silicon, 
or it's in trapping them in, in a vacuum with uh, electromagnetic fields. So say laser cooled atoms or, or trapped ions. All of typically then you need quite active mechanisms to isolate your qubits from the environment. So whether that's cryogenics, that's lasers, the vacuum systems. And the challenge there is that that's, that's that big infrastructure uh, overhead. Dime is quite unique uh, for a whole range of extreme materials properties reasons. The electron qubits that we use are actually um, have a few milliseconds of coherence at room temperature. And you could think of that uh, in a high level sense as the diamond being so rigid that it doesn't really have the vibrations that can couple to our qubits and so decohere them. And what this means is then we have this system that is entirely passively shielded from the environment. And so what we can do is send out into the world something that's very robust and, and simple to operate. What's the catch? It's in the fabrication. So typically how you create MVs is through implantation and then the strangle and, or the precision of placement of those MV centers is a real challenge. So if you want to create a pair of coupled MV centers, you can do that with about 0.1% uh, uh, fabrication efficiency and the, so, or yield. And that yield really just goes downhill as you scale from there. So what we've done is then invert that. And so that's using precision uh, silicon fabrication or semiconductor fabrication techniques that have been developed here in Australia uh, in silicon, with phosphorus donors in silicon, and translating those techniques to diamond to incorporate these NV centers in, with ultimately atomic level precision inside the diamond in that bottom up fabrication process. And so that, that clears our key, key barriers. Now, the other aspects of diamond are uh, it's wonderfully simple in terms of its control system. So we're leveraging quite mature technologies uh, in terms of lasers, for example, we talk about the nearest nanometer. Um, so we don't even need a laser. We could use an LED with a couple of micrometer footprint for some of these things. So turning away and giving you a break from that technical side, what does that mean? So these next couple of slides are then about the implications. And one implication is in the context of cloud-based quantum computing. And it's that instead of having then one or two quantum computers attached to your data center or supercomputing facility, and they're in the next room and have these challenges around latency, you've got them now in the racks alongside of all the other hardware and deployed on mass. So you can have thousands of them, each CPU could have its own quantum accelerator. And so that enables then a, a kind of um, mass parallelization of quantum acceleration, where for example, say if you're looking at a, a climate model, then each cell within that climate model can have its own quantum accelerator. Uh, that's, that's helping speed up your tasks. The other is then in taking quantum out to the edge. So there's whole sectors that currently, there's not really any point for them to engage in quantum computing because just like cloud classical computing isn't a solution for them, cloud quantum computing is, isn't a solution for them either. They need, for reasons of, uh, it might be network robustness, it might be data security, it might be latency, or it might be communications bandwidth they require local computing capability. And so we're able to support that and provide quantum acceleration in a satellite or in an autonomous vehicle or, or even just under your desk. So that really changes then the, the scope of applications and brings new industries and new users in already. So even, even with today's early quantum computers, by prov providing that pathway, we're able to uh, justify people to engage in quantum computing today. A quick example here would be around the uh, applications in terms of onboard satellites. I won't go into this, I'm conscious I'm uh, running a little long on time here, but just to say that we are working then with a range of uh, partners. In this case, it's a defence uh, applications company based here in Australia and looking at real world applications of quantum computers and uh, in that deployed edge quantum computing environment. Uh, currently not with hardware to confirm, but uh, in the simulation sense. So the key thing here is around that shift of how we think about quantum from being a cloud-based system uh, to something that's just a component of any computing system that you might build. And you can use that in all the ways that you'd be using uh, a classical computer today. So what can we do to help and what are we looking to do in Europe 
So we're building up, as I say, these manufacturing facilities. We're looking to engage with partners around Europe. And we've got these three uh, sets of key sets of tools that we can provide people with. So one of them is on the right, that quantum development kit. So a few qubit device that we'll be trialing, doing field trials of this year and also early next year, and then uh, looking to provide to partners around the world uh, later in the year. We've also then got our own quantum operating system that we're developing to integrate easily with the high performance computing in an accelerator type context. And then also building a quantum emulator, so a simulation package, a realistic simulator of our back end. And this is something that I really want to stress because it's quite unusual, is that we can simulate quantum advantage. Now, the reason for that is that we only quantum advantage for us is when we're beating components of a supercomputer. And so a supercomputer is then actually able to simulate the full range of early quantum application um, activities with our devices. So with that 30, 40, 50 qubits uh, with efficient quantum simulators, then we're actually able to probe that regime. So that's what, we build, what we're building tools for and using this quantum emulator to support. I might skip past this, we kind of talked to that and then leave you with this, which is then what we're doing at the moment is uh, partnering with supercomputing centers, particularly around the world as, as one of our main uh, areas of engagement. We've already now partnered with one of Australia's leading uh, institutes. So they're positioning themselves to be the largest uh, supercomputing center in the Southern hemisphere. And uh, we're looking to do, as I say, hardware field trials on site with them early next year and then looking to have similar partnerships in North America, in Asia and in Europe. The goals for us are around, in Europe, are around providing tools to support and accelerate the growth of Europe's quantum ecosystem. And then also having that local manufacturing and R&D base. For us, that's a really strategic importance. As, as has already been discussed today, Europe is a fantastic center for talent, the partnerships, and for the investment, that's where we want to be. It's where uh, it's our other home base. But we're also then passionate about helping accelerate the growth of uh, user bases and providing these tools to help people along, just like we're doing already here in Australia. So with that, I might uh, stop sharing these slides and um, hand it back to you, Anas. Thanks very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Andrew was an impressive talk and um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm very happy to have you here in Europe. <laughs> um, so at the moment, there are uh, also no questions. Um, I want to encourage all the participants to um, yeah, use the Q&A section or reach out to me if you want some contact to the speakers and I can make the introduction for you. Um, then you can uh, discuss it uh, in person. Um, so then we will go directly to the next uh, presentation uh, of IQM to Rasmus. Rasmus Lindmann uh, is IQM's head of business development. Um, he is in charge of co commercializing the technology and he has a background in uh, a few tech startups, but decided to enter the quantum computing world because of its potentially massive impact the way we live. So I think potentially we have to uh, eliminate here in this sentence, but uh, yeah. Rasmus, the virtual stage is yours. Very good. Thank, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. And hi, everyone. So my name is, uh, as I said, my name is Rasmus, and I, I'm going to talk about uh, today about IQM, our company from Helsinki, Finland, and, uh, and more specifically what this phrase of ours, we build quantum computers, actually actually means. Uh, so let's let's kick, kick right off. So. So to begin with, uh, I'd like to tell a bit of background about the company. So, so we, IQM is a quantum hardware company from Helsinki, Finland, as said. And, uh, and we like to say our, that we are, we are currently the leader in the superconducting quantum computers in Europe. And, uh, and we, 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 as I said, we come from Helsinki, Finland. And, this, this, uh, this, this, and there's a reasoning behind that. We are, we are, we are a spin-off from Aalto University and State Research Center, VTT. Uh, so where, where, where we got 
got got uh, where all all the founders came from and also where where most of our talent is coming from so so that's the that's the strong backbone from of our company and uh and 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 what we are doing is that we're b- building these on-premise quantum computers for research labs and HPC centers. Uh, that's it in short. Uh, we can later on go into what it actually entails and and what have we accom- accom- what have we accomplished uh, so far. Uh, in, in terms of resources, we have gather, uh, managed to gather uh, over seventy million in in funding uh, uh, after the company was founded in, in the summer of two thousand nineteen, uh, and also we have we have been very very fortunate in the sense that we have all, over uh, 80 people working working for us at the moment in health, most of most of them in Helsinki uh, but also uh, uh, in Munich Germany so 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 we are we are really establishing ourselves in the in the or trying to establish ourselves in the in the hotspots of the of quantum computing in uh, in Europe uh, uh, and just to give a bit, big bit background on on how, how we see this co- whole quantum computing scene now, and 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 then later on think a bit about how how do we want want to fit into it. So first of all, I, I'd like to say that there is this great shortage of talent. I, I I think all all of us can agree with that. That in order to really capitalize on this massive potential of quantum computing, there needs to be a lot more a lot more people involved and educated on this topic. Uh, uh, otherwise, the applications are, uh, are will always be there, but there will be no one to no one to make take adva- advantage of those. Uh, also, what we see now is that this, uh, if one wants to use a quantum computer at the moment, uh, there, there's only very few options uh, available. So you, you either go to uh, go and use a co- uh, cloud-based quantum computer, uh, uh, or you you try you. You try to build one yourself in in the in a research setting, and and this is this is the sort of paradigm. So there's very 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 few vendors to who are actually trying to trying to produce these quantum computers that you can uh, use as you see fit and, and and try to develop further if if if, that, if that's the case. Uh, um, and moreover. This, this, the, to continue on this, on this note of this background note, I, I think uh, what, what is, is important to state that what is right now happening is that countries are, are investing, like, uh, as Andrew, I believe, also said, that uh, like uh, very, very heavily on this, on this quantum computing topic around the world. And, uh, and, and in this regard, I think, I think, uh, I think Europe. Has, has also shown some leadership, especially with the quantum programs in the, that are currently ongoing in, in France, in Germany. Uh, so there, these multi-billion dollar investments are being made uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the industry as we speak, and, 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 uh, which, is, which, which is obviously great. And, and, and I think this, this speaks to the sentiment that, that governments around the world are, are recognizing the fact that in order for them to capitalize on this future, uh, this technology of the future, they need to they need to be investing into the infrastructure, into the talent development, and into the uh, competence building. And uh, and with all this said, said then then this, this is how we fit into this. So we build these on-premise quantum computers, and 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 the reason for that is that we we foresee great importance in this hardware uh, in this in the future development of this of this field because we believe that what by deploying hardware that you can you can start experimenting with uh, in, a, in a research uh, setting uh, that is that is of that is of great quality and of, 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 of that and that is fully optimized for that specific purpose of research we, we foresee that this is the Catalyst that will enable the talent to emerge uh, around the around, around these these machines, and this is exactly what we're doing right now. So, 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 in short, we are building these uh, machines for research labs, uh, but also important uh, early customer as well. We what, th- that we that we're talking to is our, our HPC centers because these are often the, uh, as you know, these are these are often the. Uh, spots where the where the where the scienti- scientists uh, um, uh, use computing resources, so it makes sense that quantum computers are working in this regard as well. 
So, so we are building these whole systems, but at the same time, like more specifically, we are we're we're building. So we're what it what it means is that we're building the control electronics, uh, uh, and and also the also of course the uh, quantum processing units. So we're de de from designing to fabricating fabricating to those. Uh, this is this is this is a uh, all. All, all something that we do, and uh, and in, in addition to the to the whole software stack as well. And uh, what this what this what this then looks like is this uh, as as a first product that we have is this IQM research uh, uh, research product that we that we have now released. Uh, so 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 this is the this is specifically targeted for for. For re for researchers to start experimenting with these uh, early early quantum uh, early quantum computers, and and the, uh, the approach that we have taken here is that we're we're not uh, delivering merely one one single uh, quantum computer uh, in a static terms, but instead we are we have taken this kind of programmatic approach where we actually actually uh, deliver one quantum computer and then upgrade it later on over the years uh, according to our research and development so that the, so that our clients can really capitalize on this rapid development of the field and um, and, and this is and, and the timeline for this this one is the following so we are uh, as I said we are still uh, under 18 months in uh, after the company was founded so we are very early on our, on our journey uh, so so we're starting off with uh, with a five qubit chip uh, next year and uh, uh, deploying deploying that first and then then going to the twenty qubits and fifty four qubits after this uh, after 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 two years um, and so and um, and also maybe one important feature of this of this machine will be that, that needs to be mentioned here is this uh, this cloud access that we are offering uh, for our for our clients for our clients to uh, deliver these computing resources uh, uh, to, to to their respective users. So so that being researchers and yeah, university students, for example, and this will be part of it as well. Uh, but if we look at look at look at a bit like how these early deployments of these quantum uh, computers look like, and 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 what this. What, and 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 I'm mentioning this because we have some experience already on this, and 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 now that these uh, nation states around the world and in Europe are investing heavy, very heavily, I think it is important to mention how do, how does these deals look like. So oftentimes there is obviously a nation state involved because these are uh, these are multi-million uh, euro projects. Uh, so so that. Uh, that's uh, as, as, as to finance and sort of kickstart the activity, uh, but 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 to, to make the whole whole system and ec ecosystem work on this, I, I think it's important. It's it is important to bring in uh, plenty of other people as well uh, into this. So so there there so one model might be that there is uh, some some client who 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 will be responsible for hosting the system and who, who makes the actual purchase. But in, in, on top of that, I think it's, we think it's important that, that all the local corporation and all, all the local uh, people involved uh, even re remotely in the research activities around the quantum computing are really brought together into this project. And it is, it is then deliver, uh, d it is then uh, capitalized fully on that whole ecosystem instead of just one, one party uh, controlling and, and, and sort of uh, 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 f f controlling and, uh, and, and, and giving, giving this access to. So, so this, is the, this, is the, this is the model that we, we have seen that works and, uh, and, and we have some proof of that already. So, so we, we managed, to, uh, managed to sell our first quantum computer to the state research Center BTT here in Finland. Uh, so, so meaning that we we bas we won the public tender that BTT arranged to uh, buy this first con quantum computer. Uh, and and the uh, the goal of whole whole this this endeavor that we're doing with BTT is to really is to really bring in these top experts in in quantum technologies in Finland and 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 and, and, and build this infrastructure in place and to to enable to. Really, to kickstart Finland's efforts in this in this 
quantum computing realm. Uh, and this is what we're all hoping, hoping to do and achieve together with, uh, with, with VTT. Uh, and about the project very shortly, so it was a 20.7 million, million euro project. And, uh, and, the, and the plan is to deliver this, uh, this 50, 50 plus qubit quantum computer over, over the next three years. And uh, we're uh, already, of course, working very heavily on this and, and looking forward to deliver the first chip uh, and the co computing uh, and the whole computer soon, soon to the VTDs facilities. Uh, so, so if we go forward now from this, uh, from this research setting, we're of course looking to uh, look at, looking into this HPC realm, as, as I mentioned, and, uh, and this is, and, and, and this is what, this is super important for us because we, we foresee that this quantum computer acting as an accelerator to the, to the classical resources of the, of the HPC centers will be one of the first, uh, instances where, where the quantum computers re are really going to be useful uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a commercial or scientific setting. So this is something that we are, this hybrid, this hybrid uh, computation is something that we're now looking very heavily on. How, how can we integrate this, our, our hardware and software into this HPC setting in an optimal way? And, uh, and we're looking, looking forward to uh, have, have partner up with uh, HPC centers in Europe on this regard. Uh, fair enough, but that's that's it. That's it from me. Uh, thanks a lot for listening in, and uh, and uh, and I'm happy to take any questions if you if you happen to happen to have some. Uh, back to you, Johannes. Yeah, thank you very much, Rasmus. Um, do I understand you right that um, I would be able, if I have enough money, um, that I can buy a, um, a qubit flat from your side? So. I would be always uh, be able to to have the um, actual uh, qubit number. Yes, so so that 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 was the main message exactly. So so if that uh, with the with the caveat you mentioned, so of of, of course. <laughs> but okay, sounds great. <laughs> I think you will be here for further questions in the chat. Thank you very much, Rasmus. Good. Thanks a lot. Okay, then um, the, the last but not least uh, talk uh, will be from uh, David Ubel and Owen Ernst. Um, both are researchers at the Leibniz Institute for Crystal Growth. And hopefully I'm a, I can say it, uh, that you plan to found a startup for pure or super pure silicon for quantum computing as one application. Yes, exactly. And thank you very much for this introduction. Uh, wind free silicon for semiconducting qubits is our last topic for today. And behind this rather gloomy title is a fascinating topic that we have been working on for some time now. We, this is David Übel and I own Ernst. David studied material science. I'm a physical chemist and together we plan to start up with our idea of quantum silicon. The idea was born during our current employment. And if you want to understand why this quantum silicon is so important to us, you have to know the story of our employer, the IKZ. IKZ stands for Leibniz Institute for Kristallzüchtung, the Leibniz Institute for Crystal Growth in Berlin. And it's a medium-sized research institute with excellently networked in Germany, Europe, America, Australia, and also with good connection to Russia. The task of the ICAZ is to study new materials and support research and development. So novel uh, materials for novel technologies and the assistance for research and development and industries to access these materials. For well, the next transparency, you see the specialty of the ICAZ. It's uh, semiconductor crystals. There are different semiconductor crystals such as silicon, germanium, or gallium arsenide research in every sizes and shapes. And especially silicon is relevant here because silicon is a material of our current technology. From the computer here Zoom is running on to the smartphone next to me, practically everything today is made out of silicon. The problem that is uh, is that silicon cannot be the material for tomorrow's technology as well. And this is the reason for existence for the IKZ and its research for alternative materials. Some of these research points concern renewable energies, 
for example, for solar cells. Uh, other research is conducted on materials for tomorrow's technology, like 5G or even 6G materials. And one and a half year ago, a new cross-sectional group was founded at the ICAC, and its goal are semiconductor-based quantum materials. So we want to grow materials for semiconductor quantum computers. And we already heard a lot of, about quantum computers today. For example, superconducting quantum computers where oscillating circuits are used as qubits, or ion quantum computer where the internal states of trapped ions are used as qubits. And uh, there is uh, one other approach which is extremely promising, and this is a semiconductor-based quantum computer. Thorsten last uh, already talked about this approach very shortly, and its possibility to leapfrogging the other approaches in some day. And in semiconductor quantum computers, an electron is captured or trapped in a very thin layer of enriched silicon 28. The electrons are then entangled and read out as qubits. And rich silicon 28 is needed here just because classical silicon would disturb this entanglement. The advantage of this method is its great scalability. All other approaches suffer a little bit from poor scalability. And today it is possible, we have seen it, to realize 20, 50, some say 100 qubits. But for a real universal quantum computer, we need millions of them. And this would be possible with a semiconducting technology. And finally, there's also the compatibility. A semiconducting quantum computer could be easily integrated into our existing semiconducting technology of classical computers. However, this of course has an issue, and the issue is uh, the catch of enriched silicon 28. But silicon 28 is practically non existent on the world market yet. There's no free supplier who sells this material, and there's also no company, to our knowledge, that has the know how to produce silicon 28 in a sufficiently high quality. And this is exactly why we are here today. Our plan is to build a company that can produce and distribute enriched silicon 28, our quantum silicon. Just to summarize the last transparencies, the current quantum computers are not scalable to universal quantum computers. And the solution would be captured or trapped spin object like electrons in silicon 28. But unfortunately, there is no commercial distributor for it. We want to change that with a dedicated spin-off tailoring ultra pure chemistry of silicon 28 for quantum computer. Silicon 28 is also suitable and recommended for other applications due to its high purity and its high thermal conductivity, but we want to specialize especially for quantum computers at first. When we started our research some time ago, we were quite surprised that the technology is practically not existent yet. Isotope enrichment at all is known since the Second World War, at least for uranium 235. At that time, there were two approaches, the approach of the USA and the approach of the former USSR. The American variant was quick and dirty, and by dirty, I still mean very pure here. This approach gave them a head start. The Russian method on the other side was much more complicated and time consuming. And also they also use centrifuges like the Americans did. They use thousands of them. And this made the material more isotopically pure, but chemically dirtier. So the Russians have to develop an additional chemical process to clean the material. And this is exactly the chemical process we need nowadays because a quantum computer has to be uh, more clean than a atomic bomb. And uh, we have to, or however, this chemical process was uh, later forgotten. And we have been searching for clues. And now we want to bring the process back to life, of course, not for an atomic bomb, but for a uh, quantum computer and for the purification of enriched silicon 28. So we are adapting legacy knowledge to tackle emerging problems. And what we are doing exactly, David will tell you now. Yeah. Thank you, Owen, and hello from my side. Uh, Owen talked about centrifuges just now, but this is not the only step which is necessary to produce this quantum computer ready silicon in the end. On this slide, you see uh, on the bottom left, you start with classical silicon, which you can value around 1000 euros per kg, which then has to be transformed into silicon petrafluoride, uh, which is also a costly step. But then you start with the isotope refining and on the world market, there are two or there are different uh, purities available. A purity of 99.5% isotopically values around 50,000 euros per kg. 
and ultra pure quantum silicon tetrafluoride of 99.99% values around 200,000 euros per kg. And the last two steps are uh, together again worth 200,000 euros per kg for with an end product, the bulk quantum silicon of 400,000 euros per kilogram. And uh, yeah, these last two steps are not commercialized yet on the world market, and that's what we want to do. There are uh, some institutions interested in the material already. At first, obviously, our mother institute, the IKZ. The IKZ used its uh, ties to the former Soviet Republic and its excellent research to eventually obtain Silicon 28. Intel uh, also interested in the technology since they could use their processing uh, which is already very matured to produce quantum computers in the end. They have invested over the last five years in a exclusive production chain to now have a reliable source of, of the raw material. And then there is an Australian spin-off of the University of New South Wales, Silicon Quantum Computing, and as the name says, invested in Silicon Quantum Computing. And they um, invested or are investing 1.8 millions in a five-year plan in a completely novel technology to um, then have the raw material. They uh, plan to have that running by 2024. To put that into perspective, this is uh, a sketch of the world market and we made this plot from pure to quantum pure because we are not talking about impure silicon here. But on the conventionally pure side, you have a number of, uh, of sellers which are commercial companies and are, uh, yeah, you can just buy their material. On the quantum purity side of this diagram, you have, as I just said, Intel, SQC, and the IKZ route. And for Intel and SQC, um, their material is not available on the public market. This is also true in part for IKZ, but since we are a public research institute, you can engage with us for uh, research pro projects and uh, uh, get Silicon 28 in, uh, in that manner. What we plan to do now is to transfer the IKZ route to the public market and make it available widely for other interested parties uh, in Silicon 28 research and quantum computing. To summarize this, Silicon 28 has the potential to drive scalable quantum computing in the near future, uh, but the supply of the high purity Silicon 28 is not established yet and is therefore also not dependable for uh, research and development institutions. And we as quantum computing, uh, quantum silicon want to work closely with future collaborators and customers. So if you are interested in the material or the research, please uh, contact us and we are also available for questions now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, David and Owen. I think it's it's great to see that you plan uh, to found a startup <laughs> for this, and um, it's it's necessary definitely. Um, yeah, at the moment there are no questions, but um, yeah, you have the contact details in the slides. You can also view this whole session on demand, so um, there you can see the contact details as well on YouTube. And um, if you want, you can also reach out to me, and I, I make the introductions to all. The speakers and um, the QBN members in particular. Um, and yeah, I'm quite impressive uh, about the whole presentations and uh, I'm happy to see that Europe is already very active um, 
in the field of quantum computing and quantum technologies in general. And um, I'm also very, very happy to see that um, everyone was mentioned that collaboration is the key. So I think this is the key message um, for me. And um, yeah, we will work on this. I only want to add um, that you can subscribe to our newsletter, the QBN newsletters, to our social media channels and the YouTube channel. Um, so you will be informed uh, for the coming meetings um, and the other things we will do next year. And yeah, Thorsten, do you want to add a few words? Yeah, sure, sure. Happy, happy to do so. Um, yeah, yeah Johannes, uh, thank you so much for this uh, great uh, inaugural uh, quantum business network workshop. That was uh, very, very exciting. Um, I'm really looking forward also to to many more sessions in 2021. Um, what I find very encouraging is that QBN gives, for instance, also the Delft ecosystem a great opportunity to shift its focus from its big um, American-focused um, public public um, company focused contracts to really an European ecosystem. So I'm really looking forward to, to more and more engaging also into this uh, lo local ecosystem here in Europe. So I hope we will be able to also see each other one time in person after this uh, COVID Hopefully. thing moves away gradually. So I'm looking forward to it in 2021. Yeah, perfect. So definitely there will be next year a few, uh, a couple of QBN meetings. Um, so the exclusive working group meetings where we hopefully can meet in person in the second half of next year. <laughs> this would be very, very great. <clears throat> yeah, then thank, uh, thank you very much to all the other speakers. Um, maybe someone wants to add something at the end. <clears throat> If that isn't the case, um, yeah, I'm more than happy to host uh, the next sessions, um, the next one on quantum communications. And um, yeah, I hope um, you will have a wonderful Christmas and a happy new year and stay safe and we will see us next year. And uh, yeah, push Europe in quantum technologies together. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Johannes. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.